First off, let me say it's a pleasure to be here tonight with all of you as we commemorate these important celebrations in this blessed month of Sha'ban. As we know earlier on in this week, on the 3rd, the 4th, and the 5th of the month of Sha'ban was the birth anniversary of these very important personalities of the family of the Prophet. Obviously, all of the Prophet's family are important. The Ahlul Bayt salam, are all near and dear to us. But these three hold, I think, a better or a closer love within our hearts. And those are obviously Abu Abdullah al-Hussein alayhi salam, his brother, the helper on the day of Ashura, Abu al-Fadl Abbas, and obviously our fourth Imam, Imam Zainul Abidin alayhum as-salatu was salam. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. And perhaps it's because we have such a strong commemoration of Karbala and their tragedies on the day of Ashura that these three personalities, that they shine for us in our hearts more than the other members. Although we know that they all come from one light, from one nur. And so we don't discriminate amongst them. We don't differentiate and we don't say that one imam, for example, is better than an other, another imam. No, for us, they're all equal. But because we remember them with much more love and zeal and fervor in the month of Muharram and in the month of Safar, perhaps it's for that reason that we have a closer affinity to them. Whatever the case may be, tonight in this gathering, I've been asked to speak about a particular topic. And before I go to the actual topic and the discussion for tonight, I want to begin with a story about elephants in Africa. I'm going to talk about a story about elephants in Africa about 40 years ago, and then I'm going to draw a conclusion or a parallel from these elephants to my topic for tonight, which is obviously centered around Imam Hussein alayhi salam. The story goes like this, and this is a true story. It's not made up. This actually happened in the early 1980s in South Africa. So I'll, I'll give you the brief summary because there's a lot of details which I will omit for tonight. What ends up happening in the early 1980s in South Africa is that they had national parks. Just like here in Canada, we have Banff, Jasper National Parks. They had a national park or multiple national parks in South Africa. And they had obviously wild animals, lions, zebras, giraffes, elephants, rhinoceroses, and many other animals. What ended up happening is in this particular national park, there was an influx, there was a large number of elephants. And the park wardens realized that to have so many elephants was a danger to other animals that they lived around. Because as we know, animal, uh, elephants are the largest mammal on earth. The largest land animal is the elephant. And so they realized that they have a problem. There was overmating. There were many elephants being born. And it was causing dangers in the park. So they have one of two options. One is to either move them from the national park they're in to another area, or they could go and do a mass culling, that they basically have people come in and hunt and kill the animals that they don't need. Because this was again in the early 80s, so about 40 years ago, they thought, well, we don't have the means or technology, technology or the infrastructure to necessarily move tens or hundreds of elephants from one part to another. They thought, well, maybe we could take them to zoos in America or Europe or other parts of the world. Eventually, to, to sum it up, they decided, well, we'll have to kill some of them, but we'll take the young elephants that are three, four, or five years old, the, the young ones, and they found another national park in South Africa that was willing to take them in. So they had them transported, and these elephants lived there for many years. Now, a problem began to creep up, that these young male elephants, they began to become very vicious. They began to attack the, rhino rhinoceros, or the rhinoceros that are in the park. And at first, the park wardens didn't know what was happening. They thought maybe poachers were coming in, and trying to kill these animals for the tusks, for the, the tusks that they have to use it and, the, and, the, and, you know, and sell them in the black market. So they did a lot of investigation and research and they had hidden cameras and they had all of these things. And they realized that what was happening was that these young elephants, 
who were moved from one location to the other, they were actually killing the other animals. They were attacking the rhinoceroses, killing them or severely injuring them. So now they're at another dilemma. They've moved these elephants over. They're being violent. What can they do about it? Either they kill these ones or they try and get to the root cause. They do a root cause analysis of what's happening in the park. They basically were able to determine that when they separated the children, these young elephants who were a few years old, from the older elephants, the men of the tribe, let's say, of the elephants, when they were separated from them, they didn't have a role model to learn from on how to grow up, how to control their anger, how to control their, uh, all of the emotions that an elephant would have. And because they were missing out on that adult in the family, they basically were left to do whatever they wanted to do. Their hormones were raging. They were in that stage of wanting to mate. They didn't have the mates around them. They didn't have a, a father figure in that uh, elephant colony to control them and teach them the ways. And so they were using their pent-up frustration in the ways of killing these, rhinocer these rhinoc the rhinoceroses. And so what ended up happening at the end of it is when the scientists figured this out, they said, let's bring one or two of the older elephants into the herd of the young ones, and maybe they'll be able to control them. They said almost instantaneously when they brought those older elephants in, who were fathers, we can say, almost immediately the younger ones began to become controlled because they were being taught by an older person, an older elephant rather, within that colony of elephants. And so they realized that it was because those younger elephants were missing out on a father figure, on an authority, on somebody to literally teach them what it meant to be an elephant, that they were acting in that very violent way with other animals around them. Now, why do I bring up the story of elephants when we are celebrating the birth of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. It seems like a bit of a far fetched to go from elephants in Africa to Imam Hussein in Karbala, right? Where, is the, where, where do we draw a parallel between elephants and the Imam? Well, simply put, is that the moral of the story shows that those elephants were acting in a very wild nature, very haphazardly. They were not concerned because they didn't have a older figure in their lives to control them. They didn't have somebody to teach them right from wrong. They didn't have somebody to show them the ways of how an elephant would, should be treating those in their environment. And so tonight, the topic that I have been asked to speak about, and really it's going to be very difficult for me because of time constraints and because there's a lot of prerequisites that we really need to speak about, but the topic I have been given is what does it mean to be a man in today's world? And how does our interpretation or understanding of what it means to be a man, how does that differ from the Ahlul Bayt's perspective, alayhum salam, of being a man? And so just as it took a, a, an older elephant to be introduced into a herd, for them to learn what it meant to be a man in terms of the elephant kingdom. Tonight I'm going to try and give just a few glimpses of the hadith that we have from the Ahlul Bayt salam on what it means to be a man. Right? And when I say what it means to be a man, I don't mean you know, being a male, having that gender, being born with a certain uh, gender, but rather what it means to be a man in terms of responsibility. Right? Because we live in a time today, and probably more so than any other time in history, where there is a lot of confusion in our society. Right? We all know that people have this gender fluidity. Today you can be this gender, tomorrow you can be another gender. Whatever you feel is comfortable for your body, you do what you want to do. Right? We live in an era in which Things which used to be predefined, right? societal norms that are predefined. Today we know those norms are out the window. And people are told that if it feels good, like the like t-shirt the says, just do it. right? 
We're not told that do what your religion tells you to do or what your conscience tells you to do. We're told do it, just do whatever you want. But as Muslims, and especially that we that follow the Ahlul Bayt salam, right, we have 14 perfect role models. And they've taught us what it is to be a man. They've taught us what it means to be a woman. Right? We don't have to look at fashion magazines or the internet to see what should a woman be like. No, we just turn our attention to women like Lady Zainab, like her mother, Fatima al-Zahra salam and many other women, and we look at what they did in their lives, and we try and emulate them, and then we can be women. Men also, we have examples, and I don't just say that women just follow Lady Zainab, or Lady Fatima alayhi salam, alayhum salam, because we have that very beautiful hadith from our 12th Imam, Imam al-Hujjah, Ajalallahu ta'ala farjahu sharif In which the 12th Imam has been quoted as saying that in the daughter of the Messenger of Allah, there is an uswa for me, there is an example for me. So if our 12th Imam is telling us, the men, that in the daughter, in, 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 in the daughter of Rasulullah is an uswa, is an example, is a role model for me, then us as men also have to look at the women of the Ahlul Bayt salam, and how the Imam can make such a statement. And so again, the topic is that how does it, or what does it mean to be a man in today's world? And how does our view, especially based on the life of the Ahlul Bayt salam, how does that differ from the society that we live in today? Now, this is not obviously just for the older men in this room. Obviously, you know, those who are especially in your 20s or 30s and married, it's obviously applicable. But even for the younger, young men, who obviously in a few years will be maybe looking to get married. Right? We all have to know these things. And these are things that you won't learn in public school. You won't learn them on television. You won't learn this on Netflix. Right? You won't learn this by going on Instagram. But when you look at the hadith of the Prophet and the Ahlul Bayt salam, you'll see that they have given us these, these examples to follow. And, you know, sometimes we think, well, these people lived 14 centuries ago. How can I follow a person who has no connection to me, has no idea what challenges I'm going through? But we have to realize that the Ahlul Bayt, they are timeless individuals, you know. And the proof of that is the fact that the Prophet of Allah had told us in the Hadith of Thaqalain that he leaves behind the Qur'an and the Ahlul Bayt. And he says, if you follow both of them, that you would never go astray. And we all, as Muslims, we believe that this Quran, which was just read a few moments ago, we believe that book to be eternal. It doesn't stop at the death of the Messenger of Allah. The meaning of the Quran transcends time. And as Amir al-Mu'mineen would say that the zaman, the time that you live in, will interpret the Quran. And if that's the case for the Quran, that the time that you and I live in will interpret the Quran, then it stands to reason if the Ahlul Bayt are the partners of the Qur'an, then the time that we live in will interpret and explain to us what we have to do based on the life of the Prophet and his noble family. And so let me begin by saying that, you know, when you, as I mentioned briefly, that we need to ensure that we don't always or that we don't ever really take our cues from the society that we live in. You know, as we know, if we've lived in Canada for 15 or 20 years, you'll know that the society has changed in a dramatic way. Right? Things that were illegal in Canadian law, for example, forms of marriage which were outlawed, which were banned, which were never spoken about 20 years ago, have now become legalized in this country. Again, we have so many different examples of the way the rules have changed up until last October to have marijuana, it was a criminal offense, it was illegal, it was a, it was a crime. And we, as you see in last year in October, the, the rule was changed, and now it's freely available. A drug which has many detrimental effects, and which is haram, there's no doubt about it. Sometimes youth come to me and they say, can I smoke a blunt? I say, no, you can't smoke a blunt, what do you mean? It's haram. And people will say, well, give me a hadith, give me a verse of the Quran where Allah says, 
to smoke some weed is not allowed. And yes, Allah doesn't say in the Quran, you can't smoke marijuana. There's no verse of the Quran. You're right. But there's a lot of things in the Quran that we know are not allowed. There's a lot of things that we do in Islam that, we, that are not in the Quran, but we do it. right? Because we follow the message of the Prophet. I'll just give you one example and I'll move on. It's a very simple rudimentary example. When any Muslim dies, Shia or Sunni, whatever they are, practicing, non-practicing, anytime a Muslim dies, we do a lot of unique things, right? We wash the body, we do the ghusl of the body, we wrap the body in white cloth, and we give them, obviously, the Salatul Mayat and all of that, but we bury them facing the Qibla. Correct or not? Right? We do that here. But that's not in the Quran. So why are we doing it? Why not just burn the body, cremate it, put the ashes in the Pacific Ocean, and go on with life? Be much cheaper. Right? Two thousand dollars to cremate a cremate a body, maybe. It's about fifteen thousand to bury in, in 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 this region. There's no verse of the Quran that tells you and I to bury a Muslim, but yet we all do it. All Muslims across the board, but it's not in the Quran. And so you say, well, why do we do it? Well, the Prophet did it. The Imams of the Ahlul Bayt, they showed us that when a Muslim dies, you respect the body in a certain way. You do these actions in this order. So don't come and say, where is it haram to smoke drugs in the Quran? It's not there, I can do it. No, Allah makes it clear when He talks. And just to give you the verse, they come to the Prophet. And as you know, companions would come to Rasulullah and ask him hard questions, very tricky questions sometimes. And so they came to Rasulullah and, they, and the verse says, Yes, Alunaka, Anil Khamari wal Maysir. They come to you, O Prophet, and they ask you about Khamar, about intoxicants. Right? Khamar, you see this word in the Quran, Allah uses it for the women's hijab, the khimar, this covering. Right? Because when you drink alcohol or you smoke drugs, it is a khamar, it's a covering over your intellect, it, it, it muddies over your intellect. Right? And that's why you even see these ads on TV from the group called MAD, the Mothers Against Drunk Driving. And they said that last year, I think it was, in the, in the statistics, that four times the amount of people died from people smoking drugs and driving than people died because of alcohol-related death. So drunk driving is on the decrease, but now people that are smoking and getting high and driving, their death rate is on the increase. So they say, yes, alunaka anil khamri wal maysir, about intoxicants and about gambling. Allah tells us that in both of these is a benefit. Right? There's a benefit in intoxicants and there's a benefit in gambling. And who can doubt that? Right? Today you can go to your local corner store, buy a $2 lottery ticket, and you could win a $50 million jackpot. Right? Who can deny the fact that there is benefit in that gambling? Nobody could deny it. But Allah says there's also a sin in it. And the sin is much greater than the benefit. So maybe there is a benefit to smoke weed. Maybe there is a benefit to drink a bit of alcohol every day as some of the scientists report. Maybe there is a benefit to buying the lottery ticket. But what is the detrimental harm that is caused to society to the medical profession, to all of the problems that come from these two evils that are within human society today. So the point is, is that Allah, He talks in general terms in the Quran. And if you and I want to know the specifics, we have to go to the source, the teachers, and those are none other than our beloved Prophet Muhammad and the Ahlul Bayt, alayhum wassalatu wassalam. So let me go through three hadith tonight. Three hadith about what it means to be a man. Now obviously, you know, in order to do justice, I would have to talk what it means to be a woman. I don't have that time tonight. Maybe another opportunity will avail us to speak on that because we have to be fair and we have to present both sides of the argument because all of society, we have this imbalance, right? People want their rights. People keep talking, my rights, my rights, women's rights, this person's rights, that person's rights. Well, yeah, we have rights, but we also have responsibilities. 
Right? Nobody just has rights. So I can take, take, take. Give me, give me, give me what's my due. Well, what do you have to give back to society? What do you as a woman have to give back to the family? Just as the man has to give certain things and he has to concede certain things, so does the woman in the family. And again, we have to look at it from the holistic perspective. I don't have that time tonight, so I'm just going to pick on the men. Hopefully you won't hold it against me tonight. But we have responsibilities as men that we have to fulfill. And sometimes when you see that we have divorces in our Muslim community, and you know, I was reading one of the Maraja of Qum in Iran, and this is an article or a statement he gave about five or six years ago, and he mentioned that from his statistics that he knows about in Iran, five or six years ago, they had a 50% divorce rate. One in every two marriages, according to this scholar, was ending up in divorce. Right? What was it about? What was the reason? Right? And maybe if we look at Canada, or if we look at countries that many of us have come from, we might be seeing the same thing maybe. The divorces are on the rise, right? What is the reason for it? We all have money, alhamdulillah. So it's not that, you know, that the husband doesn't have the money. I've seen people who are millionaires, but yet they're getting divorced. So it's not a matter of finances. They have a beautiful home. They have children. They have a nice car. They have vacations. So something is going wrong in, the, in, 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 in our psyche, in our mind. And maybe the society that we're living in is poisoning our minds. Right? Because we're watching the soap operas and the dramas on television. And we're seeing these beautiful lifestyles. Right? We're watching all these reality shows. And we're thinking, well, my life isn't like that. Why doesn't my husband do that for me? Or why doesn't my wife, when I come home, do that for me? And so, let me just mention the three hadith and I'll conclude for tonight. The first hadith comes to us from the sixth Imam, Imam, Imam Sadiq alayhi salam. Allahumma salli al Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. In which he talks about the increase of love on two different levels. Primarily the love for one's wife and how that should increase. And so the hadith says, in the Arabic, he says, Kullu man ishtadda lana hubban, ishtadda linnisa'i hubban. That the more a man's love for us, the Ahlul Bayt, increases, the more the love for his wife should increase. Now he's not talking about love in a lustful sense. No, he's saying that the more a, a, a follower of the Ahlul Bayt has a love for the Prophet and his family, the more we begin to connect to the Prophet and his family, the more we begin to love and respect and honor the Ahlul Bayt, the more we should love our wives, the more we should respect our wives. Sometimes we think that love of Ahlul Bayt is just to go to Iraq for ziyarat, we go and kiss all the different shrines, we take our prayer beads, we rub it on the dhari, and that we love the Ahlul Bayt. But then we come home and we physically abuse our wife, we yell, our, we yell at our children. We do other things. But the sixth Imam is saying us, if your love for us is increasing, then the love for your wife should increase. Right? There's a correlation. It's, there should be that they go both together. You can't say, I love Rasulullah, but yet I'm going to be harsh to people around me. Right? You can't say, I love Allah, and I just do what I want to do because the Quran tells us, Kul in kuntum Allah, right? Allah tells us that if you say that you love Allah, then we have to follow the Prophet. And the Prophet was never seen beating his wife, although many of his wives caused him great harm. Right? You look at Surah Tahrim in the Quran, some of the wives of Rasulullah were very harsh with the Messenger of God. They launched wars against Amir al-Mu'mineen, at least one of the wives of the Prophet. But yet, you don't see the Prophet using abuse against them, even verbal abuse. And maybe he had a right to sometimes, but he never did so. And so if we follow Rasulullah, if we follow the Ahlul Bayt, then the sixth Imam says that if you love us, and your love for the Ahlul Bayt is increasing, increasing, don't just show it by going to Ziyarah or walking from Najaf to Karbala, that's great. Do the walk from Najaf to Karbala. 
But that's just one indicator of your love for the Ahlul Bayt. When you come back from that ziyarah, your interaction with your family should be different. Your wife should say that my husband went for ziyarah and there's a change in his character. He's a different man today. It shouldn't be that he just went and he walked 50, 60 kilometers and now he's the same old man, does the same old things over and over again. No, the sixth Imam says, again, the more a man's love for us, the Ahlul Bayt increases, the more his love for his wife should increase. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. In the second hadith, the message comes from the beloved Prophet of Islam. And he talks about, the, as he says, the khayru rijal min ummati, the best of men from my community. And there are a lot of hadith, or there's a few hadith we can say that have a similar theme. That the best of people of the ummah, the best of men, the best of women of the ummah. We have the hadith of Lady Zahra alayha salam where she was asked, or her and her father, the messenger, were having a discussion, and the Prophet asked her that, what is your opinion of the best of women? And she went on to say that it's the best of women, is the one who doesn't look at strange men, and that no men look at her. Obviously, we live in an environment where that's not possible. She was speaking of the ideal situation in a, in, in a society which doesn't exist anywhere on earth, literally today. And maybe even then it never existed. But when Rasulullah speaks, he says, Khayru rijal min ummati, the best of men of my community. He says, La yatata wa luna ala ahlihim, wa yahinnuna alayhim wa la yadlimunahum. He says, The best of men are those who are not harsh when dealing with their family. Right? Having clemency, having leniency, being gentle with our family members you know this is even in the quran we have that verse where allah says muhammadun rasulullah oh. allahumma salli ala muhammad wa ali muhammad oh. allah says wal ladina ma'ahu ashidda wal al kuffar ruhama'u baynahum that those who are with the prophet are harsh against the kuffar against the belligerent non-believers who are working against islam but when we're with one another, ruhama ubainahum, we should be merciful amongst one another. Right? Sometimes as Muslims, we're the opposite. We go to work and we're really nice with our non-Muslim co-workers, right? With our secretaries and our co-workers. We're the best of akhlaq. But then you come home and you see a completely different person, man or woman, whatever it is. The Prophet says the best of men is the one who is not harsh when he deals with his family. He shows compassion to them. And he says, Wala yadli, wala He does not dominate over them. Doesn't take away their rights. Right? In a family, everybody has rights. The woman has rights. The husband has rights. The children have rights. I mean, Islam is a religion where even animals have rights. So if an animal has a right in Islam, Right? Animals have the right, you don't abuse them. You don't hit a dog just because he's a dog. Yeah, he's a nudges animal if he touches you. But you don't go and throw a rock or you hit a dog. If we're told to respect animals, right, to the point where there's a beautiful hadith that Ayatollah Jawadi Amali quotes in one of his books, where one time Rasulullah is making wudu, he's getting ready to pray. And a cat comes, and the cat is thirsty. So what does the Prophet do? He stops his wudu, the bowl that he had the water, and he gave it to the cat. He let the cat drink the water, and then he started his wudu again. He's a rahmatul lil alameen. He's a mercy to the entire universe. If he can be merciful to a cat, and he tells you and I to follow his tradition, you think he's going to be harsh with his family? No, he's not going to. He's not going to be oppressive to his children, to his wife, to his companions. Right? Even the enemies who hated Rasulullah, the, pro the Prophet of God will make a dua for them. Oh Allah, forgive my people. Because they don't know right from wrong. They're confused. They're in this paradoxical world that they live in. 
And so the Messenger of God tells us, if you want to be the best man of Islam in this Ummah, respect your family, respect your children, respect your spouse. Don't be unfair to them. And there's so many other examples that the Hadith talk about. I'll cut it short, I'll just end with one last Hadith. And this one also comes from Rasulullah, in which he talks about the role of the man or the husband. And again, these traditions, you know, they're very easy to read. But when I sit down and think that, am I putting these into practice? That's where the challenge comes. Because it's easy to take a hadith and, you know, put it on a wall or just read it and say, mashallah, right, the Prophet spoke the truth. But the challenge is how do I internalize these ahadith of the Messenger of God? How do I be a man not based on what my society is telling me to do, but how do I be a man based on what the Prophet wants me to do? Right? How do I be a man and follow the life of Amir al-Mu'mineen? Right? I see so many young men, they have these Zulfiqar necklaces, right? And nowadays I see young guys, they've got tattoos of Zulfiqar on their backs. MashaAllah, you've got a big tattoo on your back. You're a man. You know, you put up with all that pain for a tattoo. But then you go and beat your girlfriend or your wife. Hopefully not your girlfriend, because that's haram. So don't do that. But you beat your wife or you're rude to your parents, right? But you've got the necklace around your neck of Imam Ali. But do you think Imam Ali ever beat Lady Zahra salam? Do you think ever there was ever a case of spousal abuse in their family? I doubt it. Never. Impossible. He could never lay even a finger on her. To the point where the day after they get married, and Rasulullah goes and asks Amir al-Mu'mineen that, How did you find my daughter? It's your first night of marriage. And he says that she is the best helper in obedience to Allah. Right? It's through marrying her, Amir al-Mu'mineen, he completes his Iman, and he says that it's through marrying Lady Zahra that I found my best helper in the obedience to Allah. And then Lady Zahra is asked the same question from her father, that how did you find your husband Ali? And she says that he's the best of husbands, that she could never ask for anybody better than him. So definitely he never laid a finger on his wife or the children. And I'm sure it's the same for Imam Hassan and Hussein all the way down the line. And so we have to not just wear the necklace of Imam Ali or have a t-shirt that says, you know, live like Ali, die like Hussein. We sometimes have these t-shirts our young men wear. It's great to wear the t-shirt, maybe it's an inspiration. But let's learn what their life is about and then try and internalize and live that in our lives. So the Prophet says, he was speaking to one of the females in Medina. And he says to her that the woman has certain rights over her husband. That as men, we have an obligation over our spouse that we have to fulfill. He says the first one is that he satiates her hunger. Right? Meaning as men, it is an obligation that is wajib on us. Even if our wife is working and having an income and making her own money, that woman has no need to give even a dollar into the house expenses. She can get her paycheck and it should go if the house is being run in, in, in a certain way that that money would go directly into her bank account. The man has to provide. The man has to go to work, pay the bills, pay the rent, pay the mortgage, buy the food. The first thing the Prophet says is that he should be the one who satiates her stomach. He puts food on the table. Right? That is an obligation as men that we have that, that nafaka, that we have to put certain things in place. And that is the first thing that Rasulullah told this woman whose name was Hawla. He says that your right over your husband is that he feeds you. He has to bring food home to you. And then the second thing he says is that you have a right that he pays for your clothing. So again, a woman can make her own money. He, she doesn't have to spend on her own clothing. She wants to go to the mall and buy something, as long as it's obviously acceptable from Islamic perspective. She doesn't have to spend her own money. The husband is obligated to provide for that. So the young men in this room, make sure you get a good education, 
Go to university, get a good job, make good money so you can provide for your families. Because it's up to us, the men, right? Contrary to this Western society where people leave these, you know, these, oh, this is mine, and no, you know, no, the man should provide these. This is an obligation on the men. So the Prophet told, tells her that your husband should be providing your clothing for you. Now, obviously, I should also mention that women should realize that they shouldn't go to extravagance, right? You see that sometimes these purses, $2,000, $3,000 for a purse, thousands of dollars for shoes. You know, it's not just one pair of shoes. We want a, a pair of shoes to match this outfit and that outfit and that outfit. And before you know it, you have a closet the size of this center full of shoes. No, let's be easy on our husbands. Let's realize that money is not infinite. There's a finite amount of money that our husbands have. But men should not be stingy at the same time. If we can afford then we should buy for our spouse, for our children. Give them the luxuries of this life. It's not haram to lead a good life. Right? We have no prohibition from enjoying the good things. We don't go to you know, israf and, and be extravagant in life, but we have to look nice as Muslims. We should spend that kind of money. It's no problem with it. So food, clothing, and he says that your husband is obligated to teach you. And in the hadith, he says the salat and the zakat to teach the wife the rules. Because obviously, if you look at it from the time of the Prophet, there was this issue where women maybe didn't have that level of education. They didn't have public schools to go to. Right? Women were traditionally at home, taking care of their children. And so the men, the husband would go to the masjid, he would hear from the Prophet a hadith, he would learn something from the, the, the sunnah of Rasulullah, and so he would go home and teach it to his wife. Incidentally, even in the books of our maraja, if you look in some of their risalas, they'll tell us that it is an obligation on the father to provide for the educational needs of the children. Not only secular studies, so the parents should, to the best of their ability, pay for their children's you know, university or post-secondary education. But also as important, if not more important, is to ensure that our children have religious knowledge. If the father is not able to teach his children about Islam, then he has to make sure he sends them to the weekend madrasa or the, the full-time Islamic school, that our children are educated from the day one that they're born about the religion of Islam. That we don't wait until they're 14 or 15 and then we begin to teach them about Islam. So in this hadith, the messenger says that a man, the man of the home, the husband, the father, he should teach his wife, again, the rules of, he mentions salat and zakat, but we can expand that to be anything about the religion, right? And many times, unfortunately, because of our lifestyle, the mother may be at home, she's tending to the children, she has to make sure they get to bed early because they have school the next day. And so the husband usually maybe is at the masjid, He's at the lecture, he's at the program. At least if you come home and you've learned something, then that should be conveyed to your family. And we had that beautiful example even at the time of Rasulullah in Medina, when Imam Hassan and Hussein salam are young children, five, six, seven years old, and they're in the masjid listening to Rasulullah and the Prophet is giving a lecture, and they learned something, and Lady Zahra was at home, and the hadith mentions that Imam Hassan runs home to tell his mom what he heard in the lecture from the Messenger of God. And then Imam Hussein followed a little while later and he told his mom the same thing, but she already heard it. But the point being is that there's that close relationship in the family. That there, you know, the father, the husband is talking to the wife. The kids have a relationship with their mother that they can say, Mom, guess what? I went to the khutbah today at Jummah. And I learned this from the Shaykh, he mentioned these things. We have to develop and, and, and inculcate in our children that, that, that bond where they can have open communication. Even Surah Luqman is another example. Right? Beautiful chapter of the Quran, if you get a chance to study it, you see how Luqman talks to his son, Ya Bunayya, la tushrik billah, inna shirka la dhulmun adheem, Ya Bunayya, Ya Bunayya, oh my dear son, oh my dear son. Right? The way that the father and son are talking to one another. It's not what is in this society. You watch The Simpsons, 
And you see how Bart talks to his father, calls him by his first name, he insults his father, he ridicules his father in public. Right? Luqman is not like that. Rasulullah with Imam Hassan and Hussein is not like that. But sometimes our children get into that mode because we watch those television shows and we learn that bad akhlaq. And then at the end, and I'll end with this, is that Rasulullah says at the end of the hadith that yes, the man has to provide the food, the clothing. He has to be able to teach his wife when she needs to know these things that he learns. He says that the woman has an obligation here as well. And he says that her obligation, which is the right of the husband, is that she does not disobey her husband in these regards. Now there's a lot of interpretation of what could that mean. But one of the things is that when it comes to the religious rulings, we have to realize that we're all in this boat together. Right? So as Allah says in the Quran, وَتَعَاوَنُوا عَلَى الْبِرِّ وَالتَّقْوَى وَلَا تَعَاوَنُوا عَلَى الْإِثْمِ وَالْعُدْوَانِ That help one another. So when the husband tells his wife that, you know, we're going out and, you know, have you prayed yet? Or, you know, your hijab is, you know, maybe a bit too much hair is showing. Or why are you wearing those tight pants? You know, he has a level of control over the family. Maybe it's not something in this Western society that we like to hear. But the husband has a role to play in the family. It's not that just you do whatever you want to do. Right? And everybody has that role to help one another out. Right? As the Quran tells us so many times, that we have to remind one another. Allah tells us in the Quran, Ya ayyuhalladhina amanu, ku anfusakum wa ahlikum. Right? O you who believe, save yourselves and your families from the hellfire. As Allah, other ayat say, that this fire is the fuel is human beings and stones. So we have an obligation. And as the Prophet says that the woman has to follow her husband in certain areas. Now he, she doesn't have a right or she's not obligated to follow her husband when he tells her to do something haram. Right? I know I, I, an individual I met and he wanted to have a, a very healthy nightlife. And so he forced his wife to remove her hijab. She says, you can't come with me to the club with a hijab on. People will know you're a Muslim. We don't go to clubs. So he forced her to remove their hijab so she could go club hopping with him. And she feels guilty about it. She left the man and now she's able to wear her hijab. But a man doesn't have a right to tell his wife that you do something haram because it makes me look better. It makes me look like a man in the society. Right? Yes, the woman has to respect the husband. But not when it comes to disobedience to the rules of Allah. Husband says, remove your hijab. Obviously you don't. Now how do you deal with that at a practical level is a different situation because I'm not saying that you just walk away from the marriage. No, you don't do that. We have to deal with it in a manner that is, you know, that is going to help everybody out. In a, in a deal with it in a manner that adults talk to one another. But as I conclude, we just have to realize that as a man, we don't have the right, or as a woman, to tell her husband to do something haram. Right? Either way, it's, we don't have that right. We never obey the creations if it means disobedience to the rules of Allah. There's that red line in Islam that we draw. You ask me to do something which is Islamic, I'll do it. If I can do it within my means. But you come and tell me to do something haram, drink this, watch that, listen to this, go there. If it breaks the rules of Allah, I'm sorry. I love you as my spouse or as my whatever, but I'm not going to break the rules of God to please you as a fallible human being. Salu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Let me end there and just remind ourselves on this birth anniversary of Abu Abdullah alayhi salam and Abu Fadl Abbas and Imam. Zainul Abidin, peace be upon all of them. That when we're looking in our day and age for role models to follow, how to be a man, how to be a woman, we don't take cues from the society that we live in. Yes, we love Canada, no doubt many of you were born here. I myself was born in Canada, I have no problem living in Canada. 
I have no problem benefiting from the good things of this country. Then neither, you know, none of us should have, you know, feeling that we don't belong here. No, we have a right to be here, just as anybody else in Canada has a right to live in this country. But we have to realize that living here does not mean that we now remove our religion and our culture and we just follow the ways of this country. No, we have a very respectable culture. We have a very strong religious tradition. We have 14 personalities that we love and cherish and follow and admire. And we take from them our cues on how to live in society. We don't let the society rule us. No, we say that we have a religion which is far superior than your culture, and we'll follow that culture. It may be difficult, no doubt. It's difficult. It's never easy to go against the current and against the grain. But people have done it. People continue to do it. And if we want to ensure and preserve our integrity, and we want people to respect us, then we also have to do a little bit and respect ourselves and be true to our tradition and continue to follow the ways of the Prophet and his noble family. Let me conclude by asking Allah that on this evening as we celebrate these three great personalities that Allah accepts this act of worship from us this evening. We ask Allah to allow us to follow in the teachings of the Prophet and his noble family. We ask Allah to be able to become those ambassadors of this religion that have been able to purify themselves and to follow step by step in the teachings of Muhammad and Ali Muhammad. We ask Allah to forgive us any of our sins, to keep us on the path of the Prophet and his family, and to allow us to continue in this blessed month of Sha'aban, and that we can continue until the month of Ramadan, that we can spend those beautiful days and nights of Ramadan in worship of Allah, in reflecting on the Qur'an, on contemplating on the verses of Allah, and to become better human beings, such that on the day of Eid, not only is it a day of return back to society, but that we can return back to society having gained some benefit from the month of fasting. Not just a hungry mouth and an empty stomach, but rather a heart filled of love of the Qur'an and the Prophet's family, and that we can become those ready to await and to accept the 12th Imam, and that we can be alongside of him when he begins his revolution to establish a government of justice, of equality, of humanity, and to implement the rule of the Qur'an upon this earth. We ask Allah to forgive us our sins. Let us recite one salawat upon Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad.